My name is Whitney Soule. I'm the Dean of Admission and Student Aid here at Bowdoin, and this is our second live stream for admitted students. The first one we did was on March 18th with, with the collection of our senior officers. Um, we answered a lot of questions, and the video of that should be available in your applicant portals if you want to go and review that one from the history. But tonight is live, and we have some wonderful guests from the college joining me. I'm really serving as a moderator so that you can take advantage of um, the other folks on our campus who are here to answer your questions. We got a lot of questions submitted by you before tonight, so I have those on hand, and we'll try to get to some of those. Plus, you can submit your questions um, this evening while you're logged in and I will try to capture those questions as they come in and pose them to our guests. So that you know who is here with us tonight, I'm going to have each person introduce themselves and Melissa, I'm going to start with you. Great. Good night. Hello everyone. My name is Melissa Quindy. I'm Bowdoin College class of 1991. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And my role at Bowdoin is I am the Dean of First Year Students, which means I support and assist first years with their transition to the college, both socially and academically. All right, Bernie, how about you? I am Bernie Hirschberger, Director of Counseling and Wellness Programs. And um, we are very psyched that you're here with us tonight and look forward to answering any questions about mental health or wellness that I can help you with. Great, and Rachel. Welcome and congratulations. My name is Rachel Bean. I use she pronouns. I'm a professor in Earth and Oceanographic Science, and I'm also an Associate Dean in Academic Affairs where I support faculty. I'm thrilled to be part of this Bowdoin community, and I hope you are excited to be considering Bowdoin as your academic home. Thank you. Eduardo. Hi, my name is Eduardo Pasos. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm director of the Rachel Lord Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, and I also work with DACA and undocumented students on campus. I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you, Eduardo. And Elizabeth. Hi, good evening. My name is Elizabeth Pritchard. I am currently Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. I'm also Associate Professor of Religion. Um, I have to say that I want to congratulate you for getting accepted to Bowdoin, but I also want to say I'm sorry that your senior year has been um, abbreviated. Um, this has been a challenging time. I know it's hard to make this decision, but I want to say to you that having been here 20 years, I could not be more proud and excited to be a part of this community. I have seen so much collaboration and creativity and care in the last few weeks. So I can say to you, it's be a great decision to come and join this community. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Benjamin. Hello, everybody. My name is Benjamin Harris. I'm the director of the Center for Multicultural Life. I go by male gender pronouns. Um, I do a lot of work with our multicultural groups on campus and diversity programming throughout the campus. I work across the hall from Eduardo. If you come by, you'll see us yelling at each other, talking a lot of trash throughout the day. So welcome to uh, this Bowdoin Lab chat. Thank you. And Stephanie. Hi everyone, I am Stephanie Patterson. I'm the Associate Director of Residential Education. Um, a large part of what I do here at Bowdoin is oversee our college houses, which is um, our sophomore leadership. Um, a lot of things happen in the houses. They're also a social space. Um, so I feel really privileged to be engaged in that work. Um, and I also work pretty collaboratively with um, some of the people that are here uh, in this chat. So looking forward to answering your questions. Great, thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions here. Oh, Kate, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm Kate Stern and I'm the director of Bowdoin Sexuality Women and Gender Center and then also the Associate Dean for Students for Inclusion and Diversity. Um, I'm actually sitting in my dining room but I'm pretending with this picture to be in 24 College which is where our swag center is and I look forward to at some point meeting you in the swag center. I use she as a pronoun and I'm happy to answer questions around being a part of um, and helping to build an inclusive community here at Bowdoin. I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person someday. Thank you. Great. Well, as you can see, we have a super team here to answer questions tonight. And I want to echo what um, a number of folks said, which is first, of course, congratulations. And also that we recognize this is um, hard enough to make a college decision when you have a chance to visit um, and meet people on campus and talk to students directly. And that having to do that without being able to visit campuses at this point is really challenging. So what we're gonna try to do tonight and in our subsequent live streams and opportunities to connect with the office is for you to get a sense of not just what's available here at Bowdoin as we answer your questions, but to get a sense of sort of the personality of 
the campus and the school and sort of the temperament of what our community is like. And as a collection, we're really, I think a really broad representation of the community at Bowdoin. So we're gonna to get to as many questions as we can. Um, there are so many questions already that are coming in live, plus more than 100 that are here that were submitted in advance. And I'm gonna to try to bundle them together um, as they're sort of organized around some topics. So Melissa, I'm gonna start with you first. There are a number of questions here around what orientation is like for first year students, and also a particular question around how that works for um, international students um, when they arrive. So if you could sort of answer those two things together, that would be great. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm really glad that folks are thinking about that. So um, orientation really begins with the arrival of international students on campus. We're really thoughtful about having international students arrive a couple of days ahead of the rest of the class to have some time to adjust through time changes if they've been traveling quite a distance, to adjust to culture changes, to get a sense of the Brunswick community, the campus. So we have a really lovely program that we unfold for international students. Most students fly in on Saturday evening and we spend the day together Sunday and Monday. Um, we take an outing. Last year we went down, the view behind me is Casco Bay. We took the international cohort down to um, Portland Headlight and had lunch and played Frisbee. So got everybody outside for some fresh air. On Tuesday, uh, August 25th is arrival day for the whole class of 2024. It's a really exciting day at Bowdoin. Um, we really show the strength of our community on this day. Lots of folks help out with getting everything unloaded from vehicles, getting folks up from the jet port, getting folks to campus from all the different places and ways that they're traveling to campus. Uh, lots of programming on campus that day for family members, academic programming and social programming, lots of opportunities to engage with the community. Uh, and then from Tuesday evening until Saturday, students participate in an orientation program. And these are programs that students get to choose into, uh, programs where students could go hiking in Baxter State Park, we have programs for students who want to do service learning in the Brunswick local area. So there's a really lovely depth of programming, a full spectrum of programming. So students have a lot of options in that regard. And then the, the end part of orientation is when we're back on campus, students are situated into their new residence halls. And then we really acclimate students to the academic and social program on the campus for several days. So we bring speakers in, we introduce students to faculty, to their advisors, they get introduced to the academic program, the way that they register for courses, lots of big speakers and conversations around adjusting to the social climate of Bowdoin College and sort of the norms that guide our community standards. Um, and then we have a big closure at the end of that period of orientation, the convocation, the official opening of the academic year and classes begin. Great, thank you. That actually covered a number of questions that were um, on the list. So that was a good one to start with. There are another um, couple questions here that have to do with majoring, double majoring, and one in particular asks if it costs more to double major. So I can answer that one, no, it doesn't uh, cost any more to be here if you're a double major um, or whatever major combination you have. But Elizabeth, I'm gonna um, push this one to you and then Rachel, if there's anything you'd like to add, you can follow in. But I think the questions are primarily around how do students go about double majoring? How difficult is it to do that time-wise? Um, and how do students manage a major minor? So um, I'll let you sort of attack that in whichever way makes the most sense. Right, so students are choosing their major or majors um, in the second semester of their sophomore year. Um, and at that point, you're gonna talk to um, professors that perhaps you've already worked with, um, and you're gonna to talk to your current advisor, your pre-major advisor, and get a sense of what um, your interests are, what has worked in terms of the coursework you've had. And then together with your um, advisor, you kind of maybe pick someone in the department you're interested in declaring a major, and then you meet with that person, talk it over with them, and then they help you declare that major. And then of course you can do it then with two different departments or programs to declare a double major. Um, you can always change. It's really up until the spring semester of your senior year where you can no longer make those changes, but they're fairly easy to do. The difficulty really depends on the requirements of those majors. Some majors, you know, have more requirements. And so you're going to want to sit with your advisor and kind of map out those semesters. They're going to want to know, are you going to go do study abroad? How can we fit this in? Um, and so you're going to get a lot of support to help you think about that and um, how to kind of 
both you know meet the goals of the majors but maybe allow some room for experimentation right try something you hadn't thought of doing say a painting class um, in your senior year and so just know that you'll get that support there's a lot of flexibility as you move through those years if you need to shift it all um, and we're just going to help you do that coordination Rachel is there anything that you want to add add to that around double majoring or choosing majors I think that was a great summary. I, you know, I think that that there's many students who do double major or have a major and a minor. And so it's definitely doable and there's students who do that and also are studying away a semester. Um, so so that's often possible as, as well. It kind of depends on how, how you want to um, restrain the close classes you choose from. If you wanted to have more flexibility among the whole Bowdoin curriculum, um, then you might choose to have one major and take um, some concentrations of classes and different things. Um, or you could choose two majors and, and, and then work to fit those classes in. And again, your advisors are going to be a great asset to helping you navigate that. And um, one of you address sort of how the, the, uh, for the first academic advisor is chosen for a student and then how a student gets a major advisor the transition from one to the other. Sure, so you're assigned a pre-major advisor based on some of the interests that you express in your application. Um, they actually really do try to pair you up with someone who maybe not only um, is teaching something you're interested in, but maybe has a hobby that you like. Um, so they really do work hard to find someone they think that you will um, fit with. Um, we are doing more and more training of advisors um, to make sure that they're really uh, well versed in the curriculum, but also understand that you all, you have a variety of needs, right? And we really want to make sure that we're meeting all the uh, needs that students have, including extracurricular um, activities, possible relationships, and that sort of thing. Um, and so that person works with you pretty closely, as I said and, um, before, up until that um, second sem uh, semester of your sophomore year, where they kind of help you then kind of walk you over in some ways, not quite literally, but over to the department where you'll then begin a relationship with your major advisor. So Great. that's how that works. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a bunch of questions, some that were came in earlier and some that are coming up live that um, are generally around the topic of what is uh, things do we have in place to support underrepresented students when they get to campus and through their time here, both academically and socially? So Benjamin, I'm going to have you start with that answer. Um, thanks for the question. Um, we have a lot of programs that really support our underrepresented student groups on campus. Um, my department works with underrepresented student groups. I also work with um, first generation students. I also work closely with um, international students as well. So we provide a lot of programs throughout the year that really service those populations. In mean, the beginning of the year, we have a, a first gen um, students of color um, international student retreat that happens um, about the third or fourth week of weekend of, of school and we go off campus for a weekend at camp um, you'll be in bunks and um, of course warm showers and uh, but a lot of fun opportunity to be outdoors um, we also offer uh, programming throughout the year um, we plan for um, Latinx Heritage Month, we plan for Black History Month. We have a Native American student population that's pretty active on campus, so we have a Native American Heritage Month. And we also do um, Asian Pacific, um, uh, Pacific Islander um, Heritage Month as well that happens in April. Um, as you know, April is happening now, so it kind of got shortcut, but we had a lot of great programs that happen throughout the year that give students an opportunity to kind of be involved in the programming and also just come in and watch you. If you want to learn, you have an opportunity to do that. If you want to be a part of planning, you have an opportunity to do that as well. Um, my office um, hires students throughout the year, so I have students that work for the office and actually um, do programming uh, for different cultural groups on campus. And then I got students just like to come out and help out with particular programs um, as their schedules um, allow. So we have a lot of opportunities for students to get engaged. Um, the centers on campus as well is actually um, um, two buildings, um, 24 College, I mean, 30 College, and 24 College is a part of our community as well, and also um, Rust Worm. And students use the center as an opportunity to hang out, do homework. We have programs in those spaces. Students use it to cook meals with each other. Um, students use it to, um, you know, just to hang out, watch TV, watch movies, have movie nights. Um, they also use it for study nights as well. So we have an opportunity to really engage students in many different ways in the centers. And I think um, coming to Bowdoin give you an opportunity to really kind of see just how you connect with folks um, and learn from people as well. Yeah, thank you. And uh, 
since you brought the College Street group, I'm going to uh, send the next question to Kate. There are a couple questions that are coming in generally around the topic of the community, the LGBTQ community at the college, um, and how students feel supported here and what's available to them. So I thought maybe you could answer that. Sure. Um, my position was created 12 years ago, and at that point, there were very few out people on campus, and you would never know that now. The out queer community is very vibrant, um, very, what I love is that there are people who want to hang out at 24 College, which is again, where I'm pretending to be right now, um, and be part of a queer community, and then there are other people who just want to be out and mix in with their friends and be really involved with the outing club or re really involved with their um, football team or wh whatever that might be. So there's a very active um, tight community that spends a lot of time in 24 College, but then there are also people who are finding ways to be out and vibrant all over campus in their own communities. And then there are a lot of people who like to do both. Um, we have something, um, if, when you get to come to campus, you'll see we have these out peer and out ally posters all over campus and there are hundreds of people who have gone through trainings to say, you know, I, I'm here to talk to you, I'm here to support you, and it's a real great signpost because you don't get to see that today on campus. I just wanted to share that with you and give you this image of, of seeing a poster with hundreds of names of people who are um, part of this community who are ready to to listen, to be supportive. They might be your neighbor, they might be your house proctor in residential life, they might be a teammate wherever you land. Yeah, and I would just add that um, I think that that the folks who've been through that training often have a sticker on their, you know, if, if um, their staff or faculty on their office door, right? And I think there isn't a building that you would go into on campus that doesn't have um, at least one, usually more, uh, offices and people identified um, having gone through that training and, and as a support. So, yeah, thank you. I love that visual. Sometimes you can walk down a hallway and just see a rainbow on every door while you're walking. And again, because you're on campus, you don't get to see it, but thank you for bringing that visual up, Whitney. It's really important. Yeah, thank you. And also, to add, I know you all are on campus right now, but the College Street Collective, and I kind of mentioned 24 College, we all own College Street. So 30 College is a building, Russ Worm House is a building, and 24 College is a building. So we all own College Street. So if you come down College Street, you'll be able to see our buildings and hang out. We all kind of work closely together as well. So it gives you a little idea of kind of how we get connected with each other on campus um, pretty, pretty often. Yeah, and I would add too, if you haven't been to the campus before, that that group of College Street is abuts our our quad basically. So it's a very central location. It's not like it's, you know, downtown, a street downtown. It's really part of the campus where um, these different buildings are all lined up around student support. So there's another sort of vis visual for you since you can't you can't be here. Um, while we're talking about College Street, Bernie, I'm going to push this to you. There are a number of questions around um, health and wellness and how we support students um, in what can be sometimes a high stress environment of college. Um, so I'll let you sort of talk about what, what your department does and how you think about health and wellness for our students. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this whole conversation about um, stress and anxiety is important because probably you all are in the midst of this trying to make decisions about college. So I think we all feel for you as you go through that and want to support you in any way possible. I would say that anyone on this panel tonight would be so glad to receive a phone call if you wanted to talk about something more specifically. Um, so over the last eight to 10 years, uh, the, the variable of anxiety has been the rapid, most rapid growing a psychological symptom or condition. So this whole sense of anxiety that uh, is boiling up throughout our country right now and it pretty much affects all colleges and universities is something that we've taken to heart and we really try to think about that in terms of having mental health services but also in terms of having uh, wellness activities and forms of engagement with mind-body practices that often help you with uh, managing stress and anxiety. So. Um, the first thing to know about counseling is that it's free. Yeah, that's good. And it's confidential. And 30% uh, of our students last year came into counseling. And by the time students graduate their senior year, about 50% of the students have utilized counseling. So it is certainly um, available to you and a lot of students feel comfortable accessing it and uh, taking advantage of it. Um, we, um, 
generally see students on a biweekly basis, but we look at each student's needs individually. So if someone needed more support than that, um, we would make that available to them. Um, and occasionally students need an off-campus referral source, so we will help you find that and establish that and make a contact. Um, sometimes uh, we have some specialty connections with eating disorders and substance use and misuse off-campus that we would refer you to. Uh, to get an even higher level of support. And sometimes neuropsychological testing is something that will help you if uh, it looks like there's some kind of learning disability that might be interfering with your academic performance. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say about wellness is that, um, well, the commitment the college has to mental health is, is pretty huge. And this year, we're gonna add two new staff members. We're gonna have a full-time psychiatrist uh, join us on our staff for next year. And there's also a clinician who will be coming on board. Um, about 80% of our staff represent uh, identity uh, d diversity. So that's super important to us. We want you to feel like if you stepped into counseling, you would be able to find someone that you would feel pretty automatically at ease with and able to communicate with without barriers or challenges. Um, we are kind of crazy in love with um, yoga classes and we not only have like seven professional teachers or not maybe five professional yoga teachers, but we also have three students, four students every semester who now get certified as yoga teachers and they teach as well. So we kind of have classes all through the week and then on the weekends when students like to offer their classes. We have um, meditation classes, Tai Chi Qigong classes, and these all started for us about 20 years ago. I think we knew that the levels of perfectionism and challenge that students were facing, this was increasing and we really just started to put these um, programs into place for students to get um, much more help. Kind of fun thing, we have an, a free acupuncture clinic on our campus, so that's been going for about three years. And this year we started a Reiki clinic, which um, already served 75 students in the first three weeks that it opened before we all left for break and mm -hmm. we're here where we are now. Um, but yeah, so uh, if you're interested in wellness activities, you can get involved both potentially by teaching a, a meditation class, a yoga class. Um, we would love to get more of you involved as wellness interns. And we coordinate with Peer Health and also Active Minds and some other groups on campus. Um, and this year we started to develop a program to, to help with faculty, staff, and students just around recognizing, uh, responding, and referring to students who are in mental health crisis. So we're teaching regularly uh, some basic skills so that um, as a community, we look at mental health and wellness, not just as a counseling center function, but really as our whole community, we're committed to this. So it's so fun to work with all of the folks um, up here and we do lots of fun. Uh, I don't know, sometimes we do stand up paddle. What is that now? Like where we have paddle board, board yoga uh, out on the, out on the lake. So, you know, we have fun things. We coordinate with Outing Club as well as um, Eduardo and Benjamin and any number of people, Kate, to try to create, uh, you know, we have queer yoga classes. We try to do a number of things to reach out. Uh, Women of Color Yoga Retreat we did this past year was quite successful. So um, I think I'll stop there. I've talked enough. Thank you. Right. That was, that was really, that actually covered more questions that were here that I hadn't been able to pose to yet. So that was great. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to go to you next and give you a compound question, too, that um, are not exactly related, but uh, you can probably answer together. So one of them is around how roommates get chosen um, and what housing is like for students on campus. And then there's another question around how do students have free time? Do they have free time? And how do they use their free time? And so thinking about free time from a residential life perspective, if you want to take that um, as part two to the question. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's my turn. Um, <laughs> I, so in terms of how your roommates are selected, um, it's an incredibly thoughtful process. So you will fill out um, a survey in which you answer things like, what are your sleeping habits? How often would you like to have friends over? Your cleanliness, um, your study habits. And what we do over the summer is take a look at each of those things individually. Um, and we try our best to um, match people that are compatible, hopefully based on, um, based on those things that you were answering when you were filling out that survey. So it's important that you are being truthful in your responses because um, we really do uh, take that to heart um, as we are building roommate pairs. Um, I will say uh, we have a really good success 
success rate with that. Um, I think a lot of people I meet their first year roommate and that's the person that stays with them throughout their experience at Bowdoin. So um, I, it definitely the thoughtfulness that we put into that process um, uh, is we see the rewards for that. Um, in terms of housing, all of our first year students live in what we refer to as the bricks. Um, the beautiful thing about the bricks is that they are pretty central to campus. So as you are getting here and trying to figure out um, where's the dining hall or where's this class or where's that class, um, they're pretty central to campus, um, not too far from all the uh, College Street offices, not too far from my office um, in Dudley Co. Um, and um, again, in thinking about transition, each, uh, each first year floor has a proctor. Um, who is, uh, I know different names, different places, but uh, the equivalent of a resident assistant. Um, and that is really a person that is going to be helpful for you as you're making your transition. If you have the questions that you are maybe afraid to ask a staff member or um, one of your faculty members, um, those are people that are living amongst you to really be able to help you answer those questions and help you figure this place out um, as you are learning it. Um, and then in terms of what students do on campus, uh, everything, a lot. Um, I would say particularly college houses, I'll talk about that, shameless plug, because that's my deal. Um, a lot of things happen there from social things. Um, so college houses are, again, our sophomore leadership program. Um, and these are students that are really excited about programming for campus. They're excited about um, doing some things that are academically motivated, but still fun. And a large part of what their charge is as student leaders is welcoming in the first year class. So um, when you come on campus um, for orientation, there'll be a session where you are coming to the houses, people are gonna welcome you. You get to meet some sophomore students who were literally in your, in your space uh, a year ago um, and are really helpful in, in terms of introducing you to the social scene. Um, I think that, uh, 30 college and 24 college can talk a lot about programs that they do regularly, but um, there's always something happening on campus, whether it is a author from a novel that you might have been assigned in in uh, a class or we have done in our winter book club, we will often bring authors to campus. Um, uh, and then again, in the college houses, there are a lot of social opportunities. So um, Fridays and Saturday nights is a good place to go hang out, watch a movie. Um, people make dinner there. Um, I can't stress like I can't talk enough about how many things just happen all the time on campus. Sometimes um, it may feel overwhelming with the amount of things that you can do. Great. Um, just one follow-up question for the college houses. How do they, uh, how do students, how do, who determines which students are living in which houses, I guess is the best way to ask the question. Yeah, so it's an application process um, that involves a written application and an interview. Um, the Inner House Council, which is composed of junior and senior students who have formerly lived in the houses, along with myself and the Assistant Director of Residential Education. Um, we take all those applications, we look over those materials, we look at, look at interviews. Um, people who uh, do the interviews are also faculty and staff members and college house members. Um, and we make those decisions based on all that information through that, through that process. Great, and I would just add to you that the college houses, as we talk about those, they're actually houses. <laughs> they're big houses on campus that have been turned into residential living space for students. So separate from a dorm, a dorm environment. Um, so a house isn't just a moniker for a small group of students living in a dorm. It really is a house that a small group of students live in um, as part of the college house. I would also add um, a lot of students, particularly first year students, like to go to the houses because they all have full kitchens with stoves, refrigerators. Um, and that's honestly an activity that you'll find people doing just on a regular weekday is heading over to the houses to cook dinner together. Yeah, thank you. All right, Eduardo, it's time to unmute. <laughs> there we go. There are um, a number of questions. I'm just going to bundle them together around what is the spiritual life on campus and uh, where do students go to worship if they want to do that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so like I said, I'm the director of the Rachel Lord Center for Religious and Spiritual Life on campus. So basically what that means is that we do have a resource center on campus that is completely dedicated to make sure that students are able to be connected with spiritual, religious, faith, or tradition resources that are important to them. I always say that when you come to Bowdoin, we want to make sure that all of you comes to Bowdoin. And for a lot of us, that means that we bring with ourselves a religious tradition or a faith tradition. For a lot of us, it means that we're journeying in or out of a tradition or we're exploring. 
And this is an opportunity for you to do that, to get connected and involved with the groups that you're already involved with, to learn more about faith traditions and other religions around campus and Brunswick and the world. Um, the center works directly, well, first of all, the center is located at 30 College. Like Benjamin said, I'm across the hall from Benjamin, so we share that space right there. At the center, we do have a Muslim prayer room, um, and we also have a kosher halal kitchen that is available for students. And then we support mainly five groups on campus, and that is the Muslim Student Association, Bowdoin Hillel, which is an association for Jewish students, the Christian Student Association, Catholic Student Union, and then we have a group of multi-faith fellows. And these are students who apply every year to become fellows, and they get an award to spend some time on, uh, at the center reading the world um, religions major texts, and then we do a project together. In the spring semester, this, this semester, it was our intergroup dialogue on religious identity. Um, and then part of what I do on campus is making sure that people are able to connect with um, places of worship around us. So every single Sunday, we have students that are, that are going to different churches in the area. My center rents vans from the college, so students are able to go. I have a good relationship. I sit in the Interfaith Council of Mid-Coast, Maine, so I know the clergy, the, the multi-faith clergy in the area very well. So I'm able to connect you with any resource on around us to make sure that you're able to find a community off campus. And then we do have a rabbi that's also part of our center, Rabbi Vinikor. Um, she, her congregation is in Bath, which is only about 10, 15 minutes away from here. She's an amazing person, really, really cool. And we have a volunteer from the Portland Diocese, uh, the Catholic Diocese that's uh, closely working with us on campus as well. That is great, thank you. Um, I'm even though I'm a moderator and not really a panelist, there are a bunch of questions coming in about what happens with the May 1st deadline and what happens if school doesn't start in August. So I'm just gonna go ahead and answer those uh, the best that I can. So um, for those of you asking about whether or not the deposit deadline will be exp extended beyond May 1st, right now we're still holding to the May 1st deadline. And um, the reason for that is that uh, as you've listened to our panelists talk about how we prepare for our first year students and the thought and care that goes into housing and into advising, that takes some time to put together well. And we need to know who our class is um, so that we can then get started on all of the work that it takes to prepare to welcome you all um, in a really thorough way when you arrive on campus for the start of school. And, um, as we cross over the May 1st deadline, at that point, we'll know whether or not we have room in the class to invite students off our waiting list. And we need to have time to be able to do that and, and leave enough time for them to be um, able to go successfully through a roommate uh, match experience and um, advising assignments and everything else. So we know that it's really difficult to try to make this kind of decision if you haven't seen schools and with so many other things that are uncertain all around us to try to have to make a definitive decision about something so big. And yet at the moment, we still feel like um, if, if you're able to decide by May 1st, that helps us really prepare for you in the best possible way and to settle the class, as I said, if, if there's um, some opportunity for us to invite students in from the waiting list. If we reach May 1st and, and or getting close to May 1st and feel that that is no longer um, reasonable, then, then families would hear from us about extending the deadline. Um, and certainly if you have a particular need, you can reach out to me directly about that. There are also a lot of questions in here that are coming in in a lot of different ways, but uh, what happens if school can't start in August? And um, I can assure you that that is a conversation that is happening at the college and trying to imagine what would that be like and when will we know and how would we communicate that? And I don't have an answer for you at this point, but I can assure you that we're talking about it and trying to make sure that however we move forward, we are providing an environment that is safe for our community, our Bowdoin community, and for all of our students. So um, if that were to change, to be able to have our students arrive at the end of August to get started for the fall term, we would be communicating with all of you about what that means, how to prepare, and what to expect. Okay, I'm going to, um, I think this is a question for Melissa, but there's some questions around insurance and it may, and, and Bernie probably runs into this as well. 
um, in his area. But what happens if a family doesn't have insurance, health insurance, when their son or daughter comes to the college? How do we handle that if they need care while they're here? Melissa's on mute still. Um, that's a really great question. Uh, Bowdoin has an insurance plan, a health plan for students, and so families do have the opportunity to opt into the plan that Bowdoin offers. And then I want to reiterate what Bernie said a few minutes ago, which is that all of the services that we offer on campus through health and counseling are free to students at Bowdoin College, and so uh, we really urge students to utilize our resources in the Counseling and Wellness Center and Health Services. So um, hopefully that does answer the question. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Here's a good question, and I'm going to leave this one open rather than directing it to anybody in particular. It says, if you saw about in 10 years ago and now, what would you say would be the biggest difference in the community and how it has transcended? And I imagine for those of us, even if you weren't here 10 years ago, you might even have a view um, from maybe the last three to five years. So I'm going to refrain. I, I have something to say, but I'll wait till the end. Um, and Kate, I'm going to have, I'm going to start with you. And then anybody who wants to jump in after that, feel free. Yeah, I touched on this a little bit in my first answer um, in terms of LGBTQ folks, um, but just in general, the diversity around um, not just sexuality, but also in terms of race and ethnicity has really um, grown, I would say, over the last 15 years. I know the question was specifically saying 10 years, um, but I think Bowdoin has done a really intentional job around not just diversity, but then once there's diversity, what do you do to build an inclusive and equitable community? And I think that's been a huge um, effort and shift over the last 10, 14, 15 years. Anyone else? Um, I, I would say, I love the word that Kate just used, the word intentional. Uh, I, I, and I, I think, you know, I was a student at Bowdoin from 1987 to 1991, and it was a really different college back then. Um, the intentionality of how we land students, how we um, connect students to advisors for pre-major academic advising, the intentionality in the dean structure that there are two first-year deans who work with a cohort of roughly 500 students to ensure that students have a really successful transition to the college both academically and socially. Uh, the intentionality with which we work with our partners in residential life to ensure that the living situation for students feels comfortable and correct and um, that students have relationships with proctors and residential assistants. So I really wanna echo um, that word intentionality. Both, it's really in the sauce at Bowdoin. We're really good at it. We're really thoughtful about it. And everybody who is here tonight on this we are all talking to each other all the time about how to really robustly help students improve the student experience um, and just create a really amazing experience for our students at Bowdoin. And we really love doing it. And that is what makes us really, really special. I was going to say one thing related to that a little bit, as Eduardo said, um, I love this phrase, uh, the Latin word for education, educare, means to lead forth the innate wholeness of a person. And I would say the students in the last 10 years have really taken heart to thinking about like how to develop the whole sense of who they are. And I think students really want to be involved in their process of self-growth and monitoring. There's a lot of, um, uh, on the slightly challenging side, I would say perfectionism has been going up. You know? But I think that forces people then to address like how to really get into what is essential and what is important. And I think some values are, are much clearer at the end of four years at Bowdoin, particularly around um, issues of like what matters to your heart and your soul. And I think that is something that has really been a great um, evolution, I think, over the last 10 or maybe even 20 years. At Bowdoin. If I could add just one more thing, um, to me, one of the things that I love seeing us as a college and as a community grow is in the idea of intersectionality. 
I think that our students are not just scientists or athletes or Muslim or queer, but you often find students who are all of those things at the same time. They are, you know, they're involved with issues of uh, race and ethnicity and they're education majors and they're also going to math conferences and they're athletes. And so you are able to occupy a lot of very different spaces at the same time and that's welcome and celebrated. All right, here's another question that's um, one that I think a number of you will want to answer, um, and particularly because everybody on our panel works in a slightly different area, probably good to have a number of different people answer. Um, but it's a question around the diversity of thought among our faculty and students on campus and how we um, seek it and support it here. So I can see an answer that would be relevant for the academic space as well as the social space, how we help students acclimate. Um, I can tell you that from the admission point of view, for all of you who are admitted, it's something that we think about really carefully when we're reading your applications, that the purpose of putting together a community is um, to prepare the students who are here during their time to cultivate that idea of being curious and asking a lot of questions and grappling with ideas that are difficult and unfamiliar. And it's hard to do that if everybody has the same point of view when they get here. So we're, we're pretty purposeful in choosing all of you um, and thinking about you as individuals and what your own experiences and interests and questions are um, that are different from one another so that when you come to this campus and become part of the Bowdoin community, you're both contributing and getting something new and different while you're here. So that's my view. For, and, and this is everything from, you know, it could be um, sort of more obvious ways of thinking about students um, of your geography or um, whether you're in an urban environment or a rural one, whether you go to an independent school or a public school, whether your school has 10 graduating seniors or, you know, 1800 graduating seniors, those are all really different experiences, but it can also be, you know, some students are coming from a single parent household and a single child and somebody else is coming from a family with nine siblings, right? A really different just environment growing up, really different religious experiences and, um, and social experiences. So that's part of what we notice when we're reading your applications. But um, for the others on the panel, if you could talk a little bit about how you see diversity of thought showing up in your space and also how you think it is cultivated in your space would be probably a good thing for different folks to touch on. I, I think um, this is a really important question. And um, I think it's, as a faculty member, um, you really do have to start your classes, right, with some rules of engagement, right, and kind of really put it out there, right, that we, we really do want to bring our whole selves, um, as Eduardo mentioned before, to our classrooms, and um, that we learn, right, when we get all different perspectives together in the room. And so um, if you start there, right, in the beginning of the class, and I know um, that my fellow faculty members also um, prize that as well, and kind of remind people of the need to be respectful, to kind of separate an argument from a person. You know, it's really important to depersonalize it. Um, but really, you know, kind of um, making sure that you've um, made that a, a value to them and to, uh, to hold yourself to that, right? To be able to kind of shift, you know, as a, a faculty member, you really are trying to kind of say, hey, let me try this argument out, let me try that. And really are trying to generate some real discussion and debate because the stakes are pretty high, right? We really do need to be able to talk to each other, to connect to each other, and to feel a common purpose. And so it is definitely at the heart of the educational mission at Bowdoin to do that. And not only in an individual class, but throughout the courses that you select. So like there's a diversity of classes that are offered amongst um, from different faculty members. And, and I can say in, in working with groups of faculty members, I mean, that's one of the things that the, the way that we can challenge others' ideas or bring new perspectives into a conversation um, makes our work at Bowdoin stronger. And the way that we can bring that into our different courses um, also makes those opportunities uh, more enriched because of it. I would love to speak to the non-academic side. Um, tomorrow, if we were on campus, 
Um, Eduardo and I run a program called Intergroup Dialogue, and tomorrow we had planned an afternoon dialogue for people to be in conversation and dialogue together from different political ideologies. And it was going to be really exciting to spend the afternoon doing that. Of course, with the pandemic, that won't happen right now, but I look forward to doing that in the fall. So uh, whoever asked this question, I hope that you'll join us for that. Um, and the, the other program that I've been part of the last couple of years, which has been really exciting to see grow, is something called What Matters, where we take different topics that are sometimes seen controversial, sometimes topics that are, are loaded that we kind of tend to stay away from or back up from, and we have a facilitated conversation with you know, 100 people in a room to be able to be in small groups and pairs and larger groups to hear from people. What do you think about this issue? And why do you think that? And where'd you get that idea? And to be able to delve in and really listen. And sometimes we do that just within the voting community. And sometimes we partner with a local off-campus facilitator to bring in um, people from the broader Brunswick community to engage in these conversations, whether it's about politics or guns or whatever else you can imagine. But um, I think sometimes we've gotten to a place where we're afraid to enter into those conversations. So it's been really exciting to very, you know, as Melissa and everything, we're intentionally create those opportunities to be able to not just talk, but also listen and hear where people are coming from, but then also talk and think through, what do I think? Not just what do you think, what do I think about that? And it's been exciting to be part of those conversations for the last few years. Anything else anybody wants to add on that before we go to another question? Okay, um, I'm, this one I think is probably directed to me. Uh, it's a question about how we're going to handle IB credits for the upcoming year. And there's another question in here around AP credits. I know that's of um, immediate concern for students since the AP test will be different than this year than it has been in other years and because the IB exams have been canceled. So um, we did discuss this at Bowdoin earlier this week. So I can tell you that uh, if you're taking your AP tests this year, we will apply your scores um, toward credit with the same policies that's been in place all along, knowing that the test looks a little bit different this year, but your scoring scale will be the same. And um, our faculty are prepared to apply those tests the same way. So you don't have to worry about that if you choose to take the AP tests. And then for the IB tests, um, in the same way, trying to understand the complexity of this year for everyone um, and for all the students who've been working toward their IB results and now will not have final exams, that we will be able to apply your predicted scores um, as if they were your final exams for students who could not take exams this year in the same way that they would have applied same policies on our campus as it, they, that would apply if they were your final exam scores. And you can find the AB, IB, um, credit policy on the website if you want to see how those are applied. Okay, let's see. Um, this should be kind of a fun one to do a roundabout. Uh, well, actually, before I get to that one, um, what is the meal plan like at Bowdoin and is it buffet style? Well, <laughs> let me just say, the, meal, the meals at Bowdoin are just amazing. Um, I think we're all missing the Bowdoin Dining Hall a lot right now. <laughs> I know I'm cooking, I'm cooking more now than ever before for myself. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think any one of us could talk about what we love most about the dining hall, but I think there's more um, to talking about the meal plan than how great the food is, which um, is easy to highlight. But there, there's also a community aspect to the dining hall. So. Um, Melissa, maybe you could just explain what the meal plan is um, and what we have for dining halls. And then anybody who wants to, you know, add a comment about food at Bowdoin as it relates to its deliciousness or how it um, feeds our community in many different ways, feel free to, to jump in. Yeah, I'm definitely not the expert. Everybody on this panel will have something great to say about dining at Bowdoin. Uh, first year students go on a full meal plan at Bowdoin. So during a weekday, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And on the weekends, that's a brunch and a dinner. And then we often on weekend evenings have something called super snacks. So students, and Stephanie's nodding, where students can go in late in the evening, the dining hall opens for um, some food offerings for students on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, the meals are in incredible uh, buffet style. There's just a huge array of foods. We cover um, 
you know, I think you guys should step in and all say your favorite thing to eat at Bowdoin College. I think you'd hear an amazing array of things. Um, the hours that the dining halls are open are really spacious so students can get in and eat when they want to eat. And then if students are actually moving between classes and feeling a little bit more compressed about going into an actual dining hall, we have several options for students to pick up express lunches, whether that's a sandwich or a salad or a soup or a slice of pizza. Um, and those things happen in the dining halls and also at our Smith Union, which is also where you pick up your mail. It's a more social hub on campus. The Thorne Dining Hall, which is, you know, if you look at a campus map, it's right at the base of Coles Tower. It's a beautiful big dining hall with lots of glass and light and windows. It's a beautiful place to have a meal. And um, then the Molten Union Dining Hall is downstairs in the Molten Union. It's a little bit of a smaller dining hall. It's super cozy. Students kind of get attached to dining halls. It's lovely when you ask a student, like, where do you like to eat? Most students have a really strong opinion after a few weeks about where they prefer to eat, um, whether they're like completely committed to Molten for breakfast, but they always have dinner at Thorn, or whether they like to have breakfast at Thorn and then go across to Molten for lunch or dinner. Um, I'm super curious to hear what other people have to say about dining. Um, can, can, I, can I just say about um, food and religious services or religious accommodations, because that is often something that, that gets um, asked as well. Uh, we do offer halal beef and halal uh, chicken on campus in both of our dining halls. And then we also do have full accommodations during Ramadan to serve our students who might be fasting. Um, and those extend, extend even through graduation and commencement weekend, whenever those are happening. Um, and then we also have uh, a kosher uh, meal plan, not meal plan, a kosher menu during Passover week that is also available for students. Um, and you'll often find a lot of us having meals with students. That is very much part of the culture on campus. We have lunch with students all the time. We have tea and coffee with students all the time. And we get to build really amazing relationships, not only with students through meals, but also with the staff that work in the dining halls. They kind of get to know us and we know their stories and they know about our children and we know about theirs. And they really are part of our, of our team of people that make Bowdoin so special are a lot of those dining professionals that are helping us every day. Yeah, and I should add, thanks, Eduardo. There is always a gluten-free options. There's also always vegan options, vegetarian options. The menus are laid out well in advance so students can see what's available in the dining halls and everything in the dining halls is really well labeled. So you have the option to sort of take what's on the offer or to put together a meal that feels like exactly you wanna be eating at that moment in time. I would also add that one of the, one of the things that I think um, it's really nice for students, but I also think it's really representative of Bowdoin and how we think about our students and community is that you can you can submit like your favorite family recipe to dining and they'll make it, <laughs> right? Like they'll scale it and can make it into um, something to share with everybody. So if you're feeling a little homesick for a dish that you're used to having, um, or you know you want a, a dish that resembles where you've come from and you haven't come across anything quite like it yet. Dining, dining is really proud of what they do. I mean, uh, we don't have a food service here. This is our, we hire our dining staff and they are um, culinary experts and, and they take a lot of pride, not only in creating really healthy food, but the options that Melissa was describing you know, if you're if you are on a vegan diet or um, an allergy specific diet or gluten free, you're not gonna. It's not like there's this broad menu and then there's the vegan option that's the same thing every single day. They're building menus um, to care for everybody so that you feel excited to go to your meal and that you can linger with your friends and and um, feel really well taken care of. It's it's part of the community aspect of the college. It's not just getting kids fed. It is really um, sort of feeding the spirit and a, a comfort space as much as it is a practical one. Yeah, I would just want to hop in and talk about the community aspect. Um, I like I can go on and on about how good the food is. I've been at a few other places and um, I, I get my smile is genuine thinking about the food. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for a lot of people, um, when you're new to a place, going into a dining hall alone is like something that may cause a lot of anxiety. But I will say that like 
when you are in, whether it's Thorn, Molten, um, or even when you are at the pub, um, those are places where people are seated together. Um, and it's a really awesome place to make a friend. Like you might walk in alone, but I guarantee you, you like go to that same dining hall, people are gonna have your schedule and you're gonna meet people. Um, so again, just not something to worry about of like, oh, what do I do if I go and I don't have friends or I don't know anybody. The dining hall is a place where you're actually gonna build that community from the people that are eating there to the people that are working there and know your name and know your schedule because you come in at 11 o'clock or whatever every day. Yeah, I would agree. Um, there's a question here around campus jobs and how do students get them and what are they and where are they on campus. Um, I'm going to answer the first part of that and then there's a part of the question that I'm going to punt to Benjamin in particular. I will say that about half of our students receive student aid um, from the college and so as part of their student aid package they have a work expectation while they're on campus um, and there are more than enough jobs there for students who um, have that as part of their uh, student aid award about as I said about half of our students receive aid and have a job included in that but about 75% of our students have jobs on campus so having a job uh, is not necessarily um, related to to having student aid at the college but it is it does represent how many jobs are available and how many things there are for students to do the question that really goes to Benjamin is what if I wanted to work in the multicultural center is that a possibility um, and before you answer your area directly I will say that I don't think that there's an academic or administrative space on campus that doesn't hire students in some way I'll just say for the admission office in particular we have a fleet of tour guides we have um, a rotation of a group of students who work at our front desk. If you have visited the college and checked in at the admission office, you would notice that you are greeted by a student. So our receptionist work is all managed by students and they work a couple hours at a time depending on their schedule. Over the summer, we hire students to be our tour guides and to help us with interviews. Uh, we have seniors who help us with interviews during their senior year here on campus. So just in the admission office alone, there are a number of different jobs that we use to hire students. Um, and it, I'm seeing everybody nod, so I think it sounds like everybody's area has room for student work. But since the question was particularly around, um, are there jobs available in the Multicultural Center? Are there, and what are they like? Um, yes, there are jobs available in the Multicultural Center. Um, I have about I have about eight students that work in the centers and in the office as well. Um, I have a, multiple positions. Each college, um, each house that I oversee, which is 30 college, it is a house as well. Russ Farm, is it, a, is it, a, it is a house as well, um, a little different than, um, than a college house, but it's still a house. And we have about four students who live in one building, two that lives in the other. I hire one student in each building to be a house manager, so they kind of help manage the kitchen. Um, and answering any kind of questions from the residents that's in the, in the house. Um, they also help keep the kitchen clean because people cook and things like that. Um, those positions are paid, so those are two opp opportunities that's in the houses that you can um, actually live in and be, um, be a part of the staff as well. I also have students who help with programming throughout the year. So I have about five or six student workers that I hire each year to help with programming through through the center. Um, I usually keep a couple positions open for first year students. Every year I have sophomores, seniors that are part of my staff. I'm graduating two seniors this year, so that's kind of a heartbreak for me. Ray and Nate are both leaving, so I'll be making new hires, but I always keep opportunities for upperclassmen, but also first year students as well, because great first year students is good to have a part of the team. You all have a different um, idea and kind of pulse of the campus, but also give an opportunity to kind of get involved in leadership early on campus and hopefully that'll be something you do throughout your four years. So yes, there's opportunities. It's simple at, at, the, at my center, just come in and ask, there's opportunities available. I usually keep names um, of folks who, if somebody leaves or have, you know, studying abroad, I have opportunities open. I call and interview students to, to be a part of the center. So it's an ongoing process. If you don't, if I don't have any positions open, a lot of times I know other offices that have positions that are open. So always stop by, hey, I'm looking for a job. You know anybody that's hiring? And usually we know somebody that's hired. So we can give you an opportunity to get connected and find a job on campus that'll give you an opportunity to kind of get involved, but also get a chance to know folks on campus too. So, so yes, a lot of opportunities available there. Okay, this one uh, is a really great question. It actually brings us back to where we started. So it's probably a good one to put out there and we'll go around and have each person answer it. It's, the question is around, um, what's the hardest thing to convey virtually for students who've never visited campus? 
and are thrilled about Bowdoin, but trying to decide among amazing, amazing options. And so um, I had actually in my mind thought that a good closing question for everybody would be like, what's the one thing that you want to make sure people understand about Bowdoin from your point of view that, that you think is really special? So maybe combine those things, knowing that we're trying to convey Bowdoin virtually and in the absence of an opportunity to visit in the first place or to visit again from your domain, what is it that you would want students to really have as a takeaway that you see as being uh, special at the college? And Kate, I'll start with you. Um, I think if you were walking around campus, you would feel the warmth of the people. I know there was a question that somebody sent in earlier that didn't get asked, which is what makes Bowdoin so special? The students, the staff, to which I would say, uh-huh, <laughs> um, and faculty. Um, but just when you walk around campus, you can feel that, you know, Stephanie talked about when you walk in the dining hall and I remember when I was the first year and I walked into the dining hall and I sat alone for a semester because I didn't know how to break in. And you don't see that a lot here at Bowdoin. You see um, floors get really tight. Um, so the people who are introverts are more shy often have people on their floor that bring them and welcome them to lunch. Of course, there's some people who want to eat alone and that's okay too. But I would say it's that warmth when you're walking through the dining hall or walking down a hallway that um, you don't get to feel if you don't visit. But I look forward to bumping into you in the hallway and, and feeling that with you. Thanks. Rachel, what about you? I was thinking about in the classroom, um, the, that experience that you see where students are collaborating together, working together, challenging each other, and also helping each other, um, supporting each other. If somebody has a question, um, trying to guide each other because all students bring certain strengths or, or certain understandings and the ability to share and to support each other, I just think is really amazing at Bowdoin in the classroom. I see it all the time. Bernie, what about you? <clears throat> I'd say two quick things. One is uh, 23 years ago when I got to Bowdoin, I would regularly ask students like, how do you like your classes? And they would almost always say uniformly, I love my classes. And when I first got here, I'd worked at four or five other universities, colleges, and um, I do not remember students saying that about their classes. So there was something kind of magical after the eighth or ninth or 10th student kept saying, oh, I love my classes, my professors are awesome. So there are professors at Bowdoin who deeply care about you and will become very involved with you in your life in terms of like mentoring and thinking about your life and opportunities beyond Bowdoin and I am just uh, I just think that's a stellar part of who we are um, there was something else I was going to say but I'm just going to pass <laughs> I'm sorry that was good <laughs> Eduardo um, I would say fun I, I mean this really is a fun place to be there's just a lot of opportunities for you to learn academically to do research to be in the labs but there's also opportunities to go on conferences and play sports and you know get to know people and really make some good lasting connections i see that in students faces all the time i see that when i talk to students all the time um, i think they're having a good time it's not necessarily academically easy but it is it is fun and they're enjoying their time when they're here great and stephanie i would say um a thing that you would not be able to see virtually is how much of a home that it feels like. Um, I think somebody asked about kindness. Um, that is very characteristic of our campus, but even in being nestled in Brunswick, Maine, um, I have like never been in a place where people are so willing to go out of their way to support um, not only students, but even as somebody that's relatively new to Maine, I've even felt that myself from my colleagues. So a place that really does feel like a home. Great, and Benjamin. Um, I would kind of second what Stephanie said. I think Bowen is a relational place, is a great place to kind of meet people. And people really do care about, about students and students care about each other. Um, we have a lot of fun on campus, as Eduardo said. Students come in our office and it's a time to kind of like 
huh, take the load off. We're not going to give you any um, quizzes about your classes, but we want to know about how your class are doing. We want to know about, you know, how, how your day is going. And we work closely with a lot of professors, so a lot of folks know each other on campus. It's really a community space. Um, I worked at large institutions where 20,000 students, and I'm at Bowdoin with 1,800 kids, which is an awesome place to be where you can actually get to know a lot of students on campus, and they get to know you. So it's a relational place. Um, we want you to come get to know us. We want to get to know you. And I think that's what makes Bowdoin a little bit special. Um, than other places that I've been. Great, Elizabeth. Um, I guess in some ways I, I'm going to repeat some of the things that have been said, um, but I will say that I've asked students who've come to Bowdoin um, many times, like as an icebreaker in the class, I'll say, so what was it? What was the tipping point? What made you come to Bowdoin? And I have to say, I'm surprised how many of them say, when I came to visit, right? And when I came to visit, I could not get over how kind people were, and it was across the campus, right? No matter what they were doing. You know, whether it was a faculty member, whether it was the tour guide, right, or, you know, went over at dining. And I have to say that was true to my own experience. When I came to Bowdoin so many years ago um, at, to, as my first job, um, I was struck by the kindness of the people that I interacted with and, and by the students, right, who greeted the person who was checking their ID in at the dining hall. And I was like, wow, this is really something, right? It's just how you kind of gauge, you know, who you're in company with is how do they treat each other. And so I'm sorry that you won't get to experience that in the way that um, current Bowdoin students have. And I hope that this evening we've tried to convey to you um, some of our excitement about being part of this community. I know that um, a former um, uh, Dean of Student Affairs here has said, um, you know, at Bowdoin you cannot fall through the cracks, right? We don't let that happen. You'd have to jump through them. And I think that's true. I think that this whole community really does create a, a safety net, a, a form of support that really allows you to kind of reach and stretch as far as you want. So that's my sense of what makes us so special. Thank you. And Melissa? Yeah, I really like what you just said, Elizabeth. And I would, I would really echo, Bowdoin is a place to come if you want to be known. We really want to know you. Um, we care so much about you as a student and we care so much about who you are as a person. So it's really not unusual at, a, at, at Bowdoin to have a conversation with a student that leads to a connection, um, a, to another person across campus that leads to another connection and an internship and all of the amazing ways that the community on this campus is learning students, learning what drives you, learning what your passions are, uh, learning what motivates you. Um, and it really does encompass everything that people have said. We care a lot about our students and we really want to know who you are. So um, your years with us are incredibly deep and satisfying and successful and that you launch from our campus into a life of awesomeness. And so um, it really is something that's really special about the place for me. It's just the knowing, the knowing of other humans on the campus. Thank you. Um, and since I get to go last, I'm going to take the liberty of saying two things. One, I was um, reading one of the questions, which was, uh, I didn't get a chance to pose to everybody uh, due to time, but it was sort of about what are some of the skills that students learn and take with them. And the answer that I was thinking of also goes to this question of what makes Bowdoin really special that's sometimes hard to see uh, maybe from the outside. But I was doing a panel with President Rose and a number of our alumni in Houston last year. And we were talking about, they had all had uh, a variety of different majors and they were working, some of them in directly the field that they had studied and others in completely different, in completely different space. And Matt Ramos, who was uh, one of our panelists, was talking about the value of liberal arts and the experiences he had had at Bowdoin, um, the challenges that he had had academically, um, sort of in different areas and uh, by sort of being all around the curriculum and the ways in which he uh, learned to problem solve. And then he went on to say that in the work he does now, he works with people who have uh, learned something totally different in the area than he has. And he said, we speak different languages, but we all have to work together to solve the same problem. And I have thought of that so many times in the last couple of weeks, because as a, as a global community, that's what we're facing right now, right? We all have um, 
different things to contribute and the, the world of science and economics and um, politics and so many things that need to work together to solve a primary problem of a health crisis on our globe. And that really is the basis of liberal arts, right? To be able to participate in something bigger than just the one thing that you know and be able to follow that learning as you go along and to work with others who have other skills to bring into that same problem solving. Um, and I think that how that relates to what I see being really special about the college is what everybody's been talking about in terms of warmth and kindness, because it allows for a kind of collaboration among our students, both in how they develop friendships, but also how they study academically. And Rachel was talking about this a little bit as she described her class, that if students feel um, respected by the community here, I was gonna say their peer group, but not just the peer group, the staff and the faculty, and their environment here at the college, it's a lot easier for them to be questioning themselves and questioning the people around them and really grappling with the big ideas. And so that idea of being kind and warm and having relationships and your faculty knowing who you are and the person checking you at the dining hall knowing who you are and saying, you know, you look like you might have a little bit of a cold, how are you feeling? Um, to have that environment around you sets the stage for students to ask some of the really hard questions and to take the risk in some of the big ideas because the daily environment is one that feels um, supportive. And I think that uh, that really comes across in so many, so many different ways and how you hear people speak about the college. And, and I, I get that feeling from students who are experiencing their first term here, as well as talking to Bowdoin graduates from you know, 25 or 30 years ago, who still talk about their that experience in the same way, who are deep into their careers now. Um, so the last thing I want to say to everybody is thank you to our panelists for spending time on a Thursday evening answering questions for our admitted students. Thank you to the several hundred students and parents who are on with us this evening and for your great questions. I know we couldn't get to them all, but I will say that some of the questions that got asked tonight are covered in the recording from the March 18th live stream. We also have more live streams coming up and that you can find information for those on the admitted student website, also in your portal, your admitted student portal. We're going to be talking with students next week. Um, so be, I'll be moderating, but that's a real chance for you to ask a lot of questions of students. We have another panel coming up that's talking about um, the McKean Center and engagement outside of the Bowdoin community and the local community, but also opportunities around the world for students to do engagement, study away, career resources. There were a lot of questions that came in tonight about how we prepare students for careers and internships. Um, so we're gonna have a live stream on those topics on April 23rd and then another opportunity to chat with students. We're also getting ready to do live chats um, next week probably one-on-one -on -one live chat so that you can get a hold of an admission officer and a, or a student um, and ask your questions directly in a live chat so we'll, we'll as soon as we have that ready to go that will be going up on the website as well so thank you everybody for being with us tonight congratulations on your admission to Bowdoin and we really really hope that uh, we'll see you in the fall I know that um, you can't get here to meet us in person but in the admission office we really felt like we met you when we read your application and we really thought you were a good match. So we hope you're gonna feel the same way even if you can't get here in person to decide. Have a great night, everyone. Good night.